If you are worried you have Lyme disease, or just like the outdoors, and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to the latest episode of Outbreak News Interviews. And today's topic will be the parasitic lung fluke, Paragonimus. And as always, joining me today to talk about this fascinating parasite is Rosemary Drizdell. Rosemary is a parasitology teacher and author. Hi, Rosemary, and thanks for coming back to Talk Parasites. Hi, Robert. I always enjoy the conversation. Wonderful. So do I. Um, So what is Paragonimus? Well, Paragonimus is a fluke, so it's a parasitic worm. It's one of the parasitic worms that are actually hermaphrodites. There aren't male and female of these species. They, each individual worm has both male and female reproductive organs, but that doesn't mean that they do it all by themselves. And Paragonimus is one of the ones that pair off as two worms and they tend to uh, spend their lives together as a pair and exchange genetic material that way, even though they're, they both have the male and female um, organs. So they're interesting in that way. Mm-hmm. Now there's two species, I mean, there's actually about, I think, 10 different species of Paragonimus that infect humans. Um, That's right. But uh, two species that the audience may have heard of are uh, Paragonimus westermani and Paragonimus calicati. Um, That's right. Rosemary, geographically, where are these species found respectively? Westermani is mainly found in East and Southeast Asia and as far to the east of that as perhaps India. Whereas Calicati is, I think, the only one known to be endemic in North America, and it's not entirely clear whether it's also found in Central and South America, but it tends to be in the Americas anyway. Right. Now, how common globally is, is um, Paragonimus? It's not easy to tell how many cases there actually are out there because many are asymptomatic, but there are perhaps over 20 million people infected and another maybe close to 200 million at risk, mainly because of dietary factors. Now, the, the life cycles of the flukes are always pretty interesting. Can they you, are. Can you describe the life cycle of Paragonimus? Yes, many of the flukes have two intermediate hosts. So the human would be a a definitive host, the host where the adult worms live, and there are two other hosts as part of the life cycle. If you pass Paragonimus eggs in your feces onto the ground or perhaps into the water, and a snail comes along and eats the eggs, then the snail can become infected and the parasite undergoes an asexual stage of multiplication inside the snail. And then the, snail, the, the parasites may either leave the snail or it's possible that the snail is ingested by some kind of crustacean. That's one thing that all of the Paragonimus species have in common is that they, the second intermediate host is a crustacean of some kind. It's usually a parasite of animals, so it's a zoonosis in humans, meaning that we're sort, we're sort of an accidental definitive host. If this usually happens in crayfish eating animals like otters and mink and skunks and that kind of animal. So if they come along and eat that crustacean raw, as they do, then they can become infected with the worm which which travels from the intestine to the lungs usually, although it can end up in a number of different places. And it's the same for humans. If we eat a crustacean without thoroughly cooking it first, we could end up with these flukes in our lungs and sometimes in other spots as well. Now, Paragonimus, like Clonorchis from last week, is a foodborne trematode, and you've already touched on this. So people contract the lung fluke via 
eating um, undercooked crustaceans. Uh, yes. So, so in Asia, how do they prepare crab and other crustaceans that uh, makes them uh, undercooked? All kinds of interesting ways that North Americans are just starting to experiment with. They could eat them completely raw and alive. They might be pickled in brine. They might be smoked. There's a, one dish called drunken crab where they're sort of right. pickled in a rice wine, so with alcohol. In South America, the dish known as ceviche is raw fish and seafood, as you know. Sometimes you might get some raw crustacean in that kind of dish. So very often flavored with something like a, a brine or a, a you know slightly acidic uh, dressing of some kind, but not cooked. Right, and it's important to note that that will not kill the parasite. That's correct. Salting, smoking, pickling, these things don't necessarily kill the parasite. Right. Now, I wanted to talk to you about uh, Paragonimus calicati, since there were, this is a species that's found in North America, as you mentioned. Right. Um, other than the fact of its geography, are there any other differences between uh, Paragonimus calicati and Paragonimus westermani? In the cases where it has infected humans, it seems to have been a bit better at causing more severe symptoms. Often, Paragonimus westermani is asymptomatic, whereas people who have been found to have calicati tend to have a cough and fever and eosinophilia maybe about four weeks after exposure, after they first contract the parasite. So it, it seems to be a more dangerous parasite, if I could put it that way. Okay. And we have seen... Uh, P. calicati in the United States. Mm -hmm. and, uh, can you talk about the cases that were reported? I believe it was out of Missouri about 10 years ago. What yeah. happened there? Yes, we've been seeing Paragonimus westermani for many, many years, but cases of calicati or Paragonimus infection in North America had to wait until people started eating raw crayfish and raw crustaceans, which is something we don't really traditionally do. Most of these people had been on wilderness trips, perhaps on river trips or something like that, where they were catching some of their own food. Some of them were demonstrating some wilderness survival skills by eating raw crustaceans, raw crayfish. And very often, when you look at the literature, very often they reported considerable alcohol consumption along with that. So, you know, we can often eat things when we've had a few drinks that we wouldn't normally find very palatable. Yeah, in the U.S., I kind of remember a similar story, too. It was actually in California, and uh, uh, there were people drinking in a, uh, a bar of some sort, mm -hmm. and they were, and they were like, daring each other, other yeah. like small, small little crabs. Yes. And, and uh, do you, was that uh, Paragonimus westermani they caught, or was it Calicati? Actually, I'm not sure, but those right. would be only, that would only be the beginning of what... <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, so, people will eat the most amazing things on a dare, and often with rather unfortunate consequences. Right. Um, Rosemary, can you describe the disease and pathology of a lung fluke infection? Yes, as I've as I said a couple of times, I think Westermani often has no symptoms. Although if it does cause symptoms, it would be something like breathing difficulty, perhaps a chronic cough and they would cough up a, a sputum that has little specks in it. These are the eggs and they're often described as looking like iron filings in a sputum specimen. But as I mentioned also, these worms can end up in what we call ectopic places. So not in the lung, but perhaps in the spinal cord or maybe even in the brain. And the symptoms that they would cause in a situation like that would depend very much on where they were located. So if one got into your brain, it could be seizures, it could be suddenly being unable to walk properly, balance problems. It could be problems with speech, just depending on where in the brain the worm was. Now, in North America, where this isn't seen very often, as opposed to Asia, somebody that demonstrates these kind of symptoms, I would think they would first be confused with maybe tuberculosis or something like exactly, that. Exactly, exactly. And most of these cases in Missouri were treated for a number of other different um, diseases before somebody finally figured out what was wrong with them. Yeah. Now, how is paragonimus infection diagnosed? Um, Rosemary, can you... 
uh, describe the morphology of the adult fluke, which I know is not really the diagnostic stage, but then describe the egg stage also. Yes. The adult flukes are often described as being the size and color and shape of coffee beans. So if you can imagine two little worms insisted in the lungs that look like a pair of coffee beans, that's what they typically look like. They release their eggs into, they're insisted, but if the cyst breaks, then the egg will break out into the airspace of the lung and be coughed up in the sputum. So we can find these eggs either in sputum specimens or in stool because they're either coughed up or they're swallowed and then passed in the stool. And they look like little... I don't want to say Grecian urns, but flasks. They're sort of rounded with an operculum at the top, like a little flip cap that the parasite can exit from the egg through. They're very solid-looking eggs, often described as looking similar to a freshwater fish tapeworm egg, but to me they're much more robust-looking than the uh, diphilobothrium egg. Now, how is paragonimus treated? Ah, now that I forgot to look up, and I'm not sure. It's I would guess it's probably albendazole or praziquantel, those same drugs that we use for the other uh, helminths. However, I mm -hmm. confess I did not check that that's still the way it's treated. All right, Rosemary, what about prevention? I, I have to assume that it's going to be, you know, cooking your crabs, etc. That's it. Because this, these flukes are quite prevalent in nature and their life cycle goes through wild animals as well as domestic dogs and cats, they're common, paragonimus species are common all over the world, so there really is no realistic hope of controlling their presence in the wild. So preventing it in humans does rely on perhaps not eating raw crayfish. Okay, and uh, as we close every podcast... Any interesting stories about Paragonimus? The most interesting thing I've read is that even though Paragonimus westermanni is known to be a parasite of Asia, East Asia, and Southeast Asia, it was actually discovered in a Bengal tiger that was living in a zoo in, in Europe. This was in the late 1800s. And it was very shortly after that, and this often happens with parasites, that the first human cases started to be found. The first human case was in a man from the Netherlands, so again, a European, but he was living in Taiwan. So there's a, a strange sort of serendipitous Euro European connection with the discovery of Paragonimus westermanni that I find quite interesting. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. All right, well, thank you once again, Rosemary, for lending your time and your expertise. I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely my pleasure.